right and now part two we are going to talk about biblical and theological tools to do that first major part of um, those four key areas to can help people within our community connect these issues to our Christian faith, which in our view really makes all the difference in the world. And we're going to talk about how also to connect these issues, issues of prevention and response to our identity and our mission as a church. And certainly talk specifically about, especially how Jesus talked about power. And that is another key area that we can help everyone really uh, connect on a practical level to what we're asking them to think about and do in terms of abuse prevention and response, because Jesus said so much about power and how we are to use power. So again, that first major area that we talked about at the end of the last segment, connecting these issues to our Christian faith, um, all of the things in this segment are going to be connected to giving you as leaders tools to help you think about how are we cultivating this mentality within our church community. And I'll just say it very bluntly, um, leaders must, you must grow into your own voice on these issues. Um, you know, we train in organizations, uh, we do training for leadership groups, we do training for congregation-based groups, the whole church community, all the adults. We're trying to get as many adults from the community out to a training as possible. And that's important, and that's wonderful. Uh, it's important to have, uh, you know, those with experience and expertise speaking to these issues. But what really gets traction <laughs> in terms of a culture is when you as local leaders in your local community come into your own voice, when you are speaking and with conviction and helping others make connection to these issues in God's heart, to these issues and the teaching of Jesus directly. That's what really gets traction and, and helps uh, shape that culture that we want. Um, and it's not about doing one sermon or, you know, a, a, a one series or something of teaching. Uh, it's you're constantly trying to uh, uh, incorporate this in, in the priorities and how you're communicating throughout your ministry calendar, uh, throughout your ministry year, uh, connecting in a sermon application point here, mentioning this in your uh, membership class, uh, in a, a lesson, when you are uh, doing a prayer for the congregation to pray for those who have suffered uh, from abuses of power uh, or those who are enduring trauma. Uh, it's in little ways that, and yes, I'm not against a sermon or, or, or a series uh, in a Sunday school setting. Um, those are wonderful, but it can't only be that. It can't just be, you know, we do a policy talk uh, once a year. Um, that's just not going to get it. We have to really try to utilize the structures of ministry, the teaching that we are constantly doing, the formation of, of Christian identity and spiritual identity, um, our prayers, our announcements, uh, our, our membership classes, all of those structures we already have in place, the ways we communicate, integrating this perspective into those is what we're after. And there's just so much biblical and material from our Christian faith, resources within our Christian faith to do this. Um, Psalm 9 says, the Lord is a stronghold or a refuge for the oppressed. God, God's fundamental nature, God's fundamental character, God says, I am a place of refuge, a place of safety, a place of strength for those who have been exploited in some way. It's such a beautiful truth and reality that we're also to embody as those who follow and walk with God. It goes on to say in Psalm 9, God does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God is not indifferent. He does not turn away. God moves toward those who need help and cry for help. And that's such a, a beautiful image. Uh, and of course, the key is we are called to embody that as those who know God and walk with God. I will never forget one of the first trainings I ever did in a church. Uh, I was still a pastor at the time. And I was walking through verses like from Psalm 9 and other things in the Bible about God's heart for the vulnerable and the abused. And I'll never forget that a woman came up to me in a break and I would guess she was probably in her 80s. And she said, Mike, I've been in church all of my life. 
And she said, I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. And I've been in church all of my life. And I have never heard a pastor talk this way about God and God's heart for the abused. And then she said, look, when you started talking about these verses, she said, my heart soared. Now, if, if that's 20% of the people in my church and 20%, that is their experience of child sexual abuse. Um, we have a responsibility as leaders, and that's what we want them to hear, a very clear and consistent message about God, God's heart, and certainly our heart as well. There are so many ways that we can go to the Bible and use our Christian faith to uh, affirm the dignity and give that type of comfort and encouragement to survivors and everyone. In the very beginning of Genesis 1, where it says that we are made in the image of God, we are invested with, um, as image bearers with inherent dignity and worth. And that's a, a repeated theme throughout the Bible. That's certainly a major theme of the Bible uh, that we can refer people to. And then over and over again throughout the Bible, God speaks powerfully about groups of vulnerable people who need to be protected. And standing against oppression, uh, especially of those who are easily exploited. So I'm going to ask you, what are some of, and now some of you have been in church uh, like me all your life, or you've been reading your Bible for years. What are some of the most common uh, types of vulnerable groups that the Bible, that God singles out to say, pay attention, uh, be protective, be aware of those who are vulnerable? There are common categories of vulnerable people that are mentioned literally hundreds of times throughout the whole Bible. So what are, just a few of you, if you would, just chime in uh, and name some of those groups that the Bible speaks to. What comes to mind? In the chat room, we have um, the poor, children living in poverty, poor, children, women, poor. I would say, I would add uh, immigrants, foreigners. Yeah, immigrants. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the poor, uh, those who are sick, those who are disabled, uh, children, certainly uh, orphans or the fatherless as a, the, the most yeah, vulnerable widows. of children, um, certainly in the ancient Near East, um, you know, especially in heavily patriarchal cultures, uh, women were vulnerable because men held all the power typically uh, in many cases. And so women were vulnerable, but widows were the most vulnerable of women. So widows are singled out very often. So you have laws in the Old Testament where God says directly, protect the vulnerable people. They're more easily exploited. Make sure that you are attentive to that and protective. Uh, the prophets chastise the people of God for instead of using power to protect the vulnerable, I'm thinking like of Isaiah 1, it's talking about how God's people are oppressing widows and orphans and exploiting them instead of protecting them. And it's an indictment of the culture and of the leadership of the culture. Uh, that's in, in other prophetic passages, that's a major theme. Uh, in the Psalms and wisdom literature and in other uh, history uh, portions of the Old Testament, there are connections to these groups of vulnerable people very often in terms of God's mentality and the responsibility we share as Christians, as people of faith uh, in those settings. And then when we get to the ministry of Jesus, do you remember any stories of Jesus where he interacted with someone who was poor, sick, uh, someone who was a child or a, an orphan or a widow? Do you remember any stories about that in the, the gospel, uh, in the gospels? Well, yeah, it's like I missed every page of the Gospels. Jesus is focusing his ministry on just such vulnerable people because his very heart, his ministry, uh, his preaching, his kingdom is very much focused on bringing good news to uh, all, but certainly especially focused on those who are uh, vulnerable. And then, of course, in the letters of the New Testament, we have uh, in, in the ministry of the apostles, we have Paul uh, talking about the offering for the widows and making sure that we're carrying an offering for the poor, that we're caring for the vulnerable. And James talks about pure religion being able to uh, being connected to 
uh, caring for the orphan and the widow in their affliction, not in some abstract way, but because especially they're uh, vulnerable to exploitation, that we are protective and caring for them in their need and in when someone is hurting them. Uh, we're called to that directly. So throughout the whole Bible, <laughs> these are prominent themes. And, and certainly this is a very powerful connection we can make for our people to talk about those dynamics of those who hold power and those who hold are, are more vulnerable. Uh, all right. So, and then very directly, Jesus named and confronted abuse in his ministry. Uh, very, and just a few passages, very powerful, very uh, well-known uh, probably to, to, to all of you. Uh, in Matthew 18, he's talking about children. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus promises <laughs> very direct accountability and judgment on those who would harm children. There are several New Testament scholars who have made a very strong argument now, I think this passage, we could apply to any form of harm uh, against children, but there are several uh, very good New Testament scholars who have made a very compelling case, in my view, that Jesus is here very directly condemning child sexual abuse. The reason is, in this context, Jesus uses that imagery of if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Those images Jesus has already used in Matthew in a context of sexuality, and the New Testament scholars argue, <laughs> so in the usage of Jesus, yes, but also in that culture, these were metaphors related to sexuality. So for Jesus to use those, that imagery here and talk about causing children harm, it's very likely he's referring to uh, the widespread practice uh, in that day of the sexual exploitation of children. So it's, it's, it's likely that Jesus, for his disciples, is drawing a very clear line to say that this is completely unacceptable for any disciple of Jesus, any follower of Jesus. And then another very famous passage in Mark 12, Jesus, in his teaching, said, Beware of the scribes who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive greater condemnation. Jesus directly condemns here pastoral leaders in a, a, a faith community who are using their spirituality as a cover to exploit, to prey upon, and financially uh, exploit widows. So this, of course, is an abuse of power. You could call it financial exploitation or abuse, and certainly spiritually abusive in that the cover and the the means by which these leaders are preying upon these vulnerable widows is their spiritual position. So there's a component of spiritual abuse as well as financial abuse. So in both notice, <laughs> these statements are in a context where Jesus is directly condemning their actions. Uh, he is directly rebuking these practices. So Jesus is very clear. And then there is a constant theme in the Bible that as people of faith who walk with God, who know God, that we are not called to be people um, of violence. So interpersonal violence, a mentality of violence is directly condemned again and again um, in the Psalms and the Proverbs, especially where it's talking about how we are to be shaped in spirituality and practices and mentality. Uh, certainly, we are not to be people of violence. And so that kind of um, violence is condemned and is held up as uh, something we are to stand against uh, over and over and over again. So the key then is, is not just we do training on abuse. We can have outside organizations and speakers. Uh, we can have you know, someone from our congregation who is a social worker or someone from the local child advocacy center speak. But if you as leaders don't have your voice ever uh, mentioning these issues, helping your people make these connections, uh, you are not going to get very far. So you have to, as leaders, assess how are we doing with this? Are we helping our people make these connections 
when we talk about prevention and response, we talk about positively the environment that we are called to as Christians to have in a church environment, uh, uh, an environment of safety and respect. Uh, is this something that you can speak to with conviction that's compelling? That's, you know, not, not doom and gloom, but is positive that we are called this beautiful, that we're called to treat one another with respect, that we're called to give people space <laughs> um, and, and respect if they don't, someone doesn't want to be touched, whether they're an adult or a child. And <clears throat> that is a, a beautiful, positive practice we can reaffirm wholeheartedly from the Bible, from the teaching of Jesus directly. A, a kind of a second key aspect of this is so yes, in general, God, God's heart, the Bible, statements of Jesus, but even more directly than that, we do want to make the connection to prevention, to our posture on these issues, to our mission as a church and the community that we're called to be. So every church has different ways we talk about our mission, uh, why we're here, why we exist, what our church values, what is our identity. So you're doing that constantly as a church. Now, some churches have very formal statements. Our mission is this, and sometimes it's informal. But regardless of whether that's formalized or, or more informal, we have to connect our community as a church, our existence as a church, to these, uh, this call, this priority of protecting the vulnerable and standing against abuses of power. Now, I'll give you a few ways of thinking about that and how you can do that. And again, these are just um, uh, ideas that, that we think are compelling, but you have, to, you have to figure this out for yourself as well and, and decide how are we going to talk about this in our community? What makes sense for our community? So I don't know any church that wouldn't say that part of our mission or part of our reason for existing is to help people to know God, to, to come and walk with God. To, to make disciples, to follow in the path of Jesus. So a passage like the Great Commission in Matthew, 8, uh, Matthew 28, you know, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So that's Jesus's call here in the Great Commission. Now in Matthew, what have we already seen from the Gospel of Matthew? What is Jesus commanded? <laughs> Jesus says here, uh, we are to be formed and to walk in the ways of God, to walk in the things that Jesus has commanded. What is Jesus already com commanded in Matthew? Well, he's already commanded being protective directly of children, <laughs> of not abusing power, of um, you know, protecting the vulnerable and making sure that the vulnerable are, uh, we are aware of those who are more easily exploited and that we're proactively protective. Uh, so these are part of the, the call and the teaching of Jesus. And that's part of what it means to, to have people know God, to understand God's heart for the vulnerable, to walk with God. Um, that's very directly that connection between knowing God and walking with God is made in the Bible directly to this issue of protecting the vulnerable. So I mentioned this verse earlier. Uh, in the prophet Jeremiah, God talks about the leaders of Jeremiah's day were oppressive leaders. They were exploiting others, using deception. And it says they refused to know God. And then positively in Jeremiah, the example of Josiah, who for the most part was a very good king. And Josiah defended the cause of the poor and the needy. And so all went well. Is this not what it means to know me? So do you see that in that, those two verses from Jeremiah, the framework is, you know, protecting the vulnerable is an issue of knowing God. What does it mean to know God and walk with God? A part of what that means, not the entirety of it, but part of what it means to know God and walk with God are to be people and communities and leaders, certainly, who are protective of the vulnerable. That's, uh, very, that connection is very directly made in the Bible. So those who know God and walk with God are learning to protect the vulnerable and making that a priority. Now, here's a statement, and we'll, we'll <laughs> here's a statement that I hear occasionally from church leaders. Um, 
we know one in Mike, I'll, there's Mike, we know one instance of abuse could ruin our ministry. We're so glad you're here. We're going to do this training. I always cringe a little bit when I hear this statement or this mentality. And I just wonder, do any of you have thoughts about a statement like this <laughs> of what's going, what might be going on in a statement like this? So let's, let's unpack this statement a little bit. If some of you want to weigh in on it, what are some of the things you think of in a statement like this? You know, we, we know one instance of abuse could ruin our ministry. What might be some of the dynamics at work in this sort of mentality? What, what occurs to you? What do you, what do you notice? I think that um, having a mentality like that can make somebody more likely to cover something up if something were to come to them. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And notice there is a, there seems to be a focus on the ministry. <laughs> What's important in that statement? It comes across at least as what matters is the ministry. And what's our first priority? Protecting the ministry. And that is a rut that we as leaders cannot allow ourselves to fall into. We have to hold each other accountable to never fall into that rut of thinking that a ministry could be more important than a person. Jesus prioritized people. We must always say a vulnerable person a child, a survivor, an adult or a child. That's the mentality of Jesus. That's the priority of Jesus. That's Mike, what matters. Yes. In the chat room, we've got a bunch of things. Our reputation is more <laughs> important than care for hurting. Yes. Uh, fear of losing financial stability. That's right. Preser preservation of the institution. That's right. Con concern for the ministry over the dignity of the survivor. Yes. It devalues individual experience and it's fear-based rather than care-based. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you all. And that's, again, we as leaders must hold each other accountable. Now, do we have to have meetings about budgets? Do we have to have meetings about, of course we do. <laughs> of course we do. But we can never allow ourselves to fall into the rut of, of making the institution or the ministry or, or our mentality one that prioritizes those things over people, over care. Absolutely. So I, if someone, and I've, I've had it a few times, someone would say something like that to me. I'll say, whoa, hold on. First of all, first of all, that's just not true. <laughs> um, if you're in ministry for any length of time, you're going to have some form of abuse connected to your ministry in some form or fashion, whether it's something happened in a home and someone's in a family in your church or, or, or otherwise. What matters is how you respond to it. And of course, what we're continuing to do in terms of prevention and that in all of that, we're prioritizing and using the priority of Jesus to care for the vulnerable and make that our priority. All right, very, very well said. Thank you all for that. And then abuse of power. Um, Jesus talked about power all the time, uh, by the way, when I was a kid in Sunday school growing up, um, I'm, I'm old enough, uh, maybe some of you are as well. Um, I had something in Sunday school called a flannel graph. I don't know if any of you remember the flannel graph, which was just a wonderful, um, wonderful medium <laughs> for kids. And so pictures up, put up on the flannel graph of sheep and shepherds and wolves, because it's using the language of Jesus from the gospels very often. And that's the curriculum I had as a kid, a curriculum based on the gospels. And so there were often pictures of sheep and shepherds and the whole point of those metaphors of, from the words of Jesus, like in John 10, Jesus says, when the wolf comes, the hired hand who doesn't care about the sheep runs away and doesn't protect the sheep. But the good shepherd stands in between essentially the wolf and the sheep, the shepherd who is a good shepherd is protective and puts themselves on the line. And it's costly and it's scary, but the good shepherd is bearing that cost on behalf of the vulnerable and is protective. So the key in those statements of Jesus, and certainly Jesus is talking about his own uh, laying down his life uh, for others and being sacrificial in that way. But certainly 
Jesus calling us as leaders, as shepherds, to follow in his footsteps uh, is, is part of that passage, I believe. And what's so profound to me, when you look at the prophetic background of the, that language, all of that language that Jesus is using there comes from the prophets like Ezekiel 34 and Jeremiah 23, and the issue, the issue in those prophets are leaders who are abusing power, leaders who are authoritarian and ruling the people harshly, leaders who are neglecting the people so that they're being preyed upon by others, leaders who are, some of them, directly feeding upon the sheep and using the sheep for their own benefit and own gain. And so the key issue, the core issue in those statements and in those metaphors are issues of abuse of power. And Jesus, in his ministry, very directly in multiple passages, not just John 10, is using the same metaphors to speak directly about power and how power is to be used in the community of faith and certainly by leaders. So that is, to me, there's just so much here in the Bible that we must help our people understand in church that we have, we can have a very clear uh, theology and articulation of power from the teaching of Jesus. And then in John 10, the first priority of the good shepherd is the safety of the vulnerable sheep. That's, and that is a trauma-informed principle. <laughs> um, it, the U.S., um, we have here in the U.S. Um, an organization, uh, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And there's a wonderful summary document they have about trauma. And the first trauma-informed principle is that the, the top priority is always safety of others. And certainly for those who are vulnerable or those who've been hurt. Safety is the first issue. And to me and us at Grace, our executive director, Pete Singer, is a trauma-informed therapist. And he says, look, trauma-informed principles cohere with the teaching of the Bible in just wonderful ways, in beautiful ways. And so here Jesus's heart is clearly the priority of protecting the sheep, the issue of safety for those who are vulnerable. And that is exactly what our uh, SAMHSA here in the U.S. <laughs> names as the first trauma-informed principle is attending to issues of safety for those who've been hurt or those who are vulnerable. So as leaders, it's not a side issue. <laughs> it's not, you know, a low priority. It's actually a very top priority for us as Christians, and we cannot outsource protecting the vulnerable. You know, we as an outside organization come in to help all the time, and we're there to help and serve in any way we can, but at the end of the day, you, we are not going to be there in your community, and leaders must have the mentality that we have to take ownership of this. And as leaders, you can't do it all yourself. That's why we have to adopt that community-based approach to prevention. You have to work on educating everyone and bringing everyone along into this mentality because it takes a community working together. That's when we're really getting somewhere with effective prevention. So proactive posture is not just, um, again, it's not just something SAMHSA says to do. In our view, it's something that is at the heart of what the Bible is getting at in terms of our calling as leaders to be protective as leaders, to make sure that power is not abused. And the beauty in the gospel in that passage in Ezekiel 34, where the shepherds, God condemns the current leaders who are abusing their power and feeding upon the sheep, God says, the good news is, God says, I, I myself will come and shepherd the sheep and bind up their wounds and feed them in justice. And of course, as Christians, we believe that is fulfilled directly in the ministry of Jesus. God incarnate comes and binds up the wounds <laughs> of, and, and protects and feeds them in justice. And of course, we are a part of that continuing work of Jesus in the ministry of the church of Jesus. And that's, that's just, again, a beautiful reality. All right, here is another scenario, and I have very good news for all of us. There is no abuse in this scenario. 
So take a deep breath. This is about a good pastor who is a wonderful pastor who does not abuse power. But I'm going to read you this scenario. And, and here's the simple question I want us to discuss. What types of power do you see? What types of power does this person hold? All right. Pastor Mark graduated seminary with honors. He's pursuing a PhD. He is beloved in his church for his sense of humor, his kindness, and willingness to help. He gives skillful sermons that inspire and encourage his flock. He is average height, but his personality and presence can fill up a room. He is not afraid to speak about his own humanity and share about his own vulnerability. Many in the church view him as an extension of their family. So here's the question. What types of power does Pastor Mark hold? How can we uh, distinguish the different types of power that a pastor can hold and in this concrete scenario that Mark holds? Um, what do you notice? What do you see? The chat says highly educated likability, genuineness, relational power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Education, outgoingness. The, the very first word, pastor, gives him positional power. That's right. He has positional power as a pastor. He has specific positional power in this church as their pastor. He is recognized and ordained through his denomination. And so he has that, uh, that, that form of kind of authority. Uh, formally invested through his ordination within his denomination. Um, absolutely. Good. What else? I see educational power, outgoingness, charismatic. Or others. Yes, absolutely. And he's well-spoken. He, he connects with people and cares for people. And that gives a lot of relational power and certainly spiritual power uh, and in a church setting, again, those are, you know, uh, those are the more potent forms of power very often is this relational and spiritual power that's held because of how people view him, um, because of how he just cares for them. He's a part of their family, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Good. Anything else? The chat room says viewed as family, outgoing, relatable, relational, spiritual authority. I, 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 nobody's mentioned this, but the fact that he gives skills, skillful sermons can also be, uh, I mean, that's hugely powerful. It is. Yes. He is shaping in those sermons how they think about themselves, how they think about God, how they think about the world. It's very powerful. That's a huge responsibility, right? All of us who've, who've served in the church um, share, for sure. Yeah, all of this. And Mark uses his power to serve others. <laughs> you know, you all use your power to serve and protect and bless others, as Jesus calls us to do. And it's just so important as leaders that we are doing the reflecting work to say to understand the types of power we hold you know our words impact people uh how we relate to people matters the sermons we give matter um, we hold tremendous amounts of power in the church and how do we continue to reflect what does it look like to use our power to serve to protect to bless that's the way of jesus and what could it look like or what would it look like if we began to use our power for ourselves um, and that often begins with, you know, self-deception <laughs> with, uh, I can, oh yes, I can do that. That's not a big deal, but just to, to be aware, to be self-aware, knowing ourselves is vital, uh, and certainly holding one another accountable. Organizations do well to establish clear boundaries in power dynamics. So we've, we've raised this issue before, but since we're talking about power, when there is a clear dynamic, a pastor has a clear power over a congregant, adult or a child, because there's a direct spiritual responsibility. And a supervisor and an employee, a counselor and the person they're counseling, a teacher and a student, not just a minor student, a professor and a young adult, 
There's a power dynamic. There's a power differential. An adult and a minor, an older child and a younger child, a mentor. And I've seen abuses of power with uh, an adult against another adult who are just members in the church. They're not the pastors or the, or the official leaders of the church, but they mentor other Christians. And in that, as an older Christian who's more experienced, they mentor the younger Christians and they use that relationship to abuse power. They use that connection to abuse power. So it's very important that we understand that crossing a sexual boundary, for example, in a power differential like this is an abuse of power. Uh, it, it's important that we not just generalize it or minimize it by labeling it incorrectly as, well, it, it was a, a sinful relationship. You know, the power differential, uh, it means it's not, it's not a mutual uh, sin, it's an abuse of power. So in any of formal power dynamics like this, uh, there are power dynamics that, that mean this is an abuse of power. We have to name it properly. So we have to give people examples. We have to bring the teaching of Jesus about power into our modern world. We have to help people understand that that news story we all know about now from our community, from that church over there about the teacher who abused the student, that that's an abuse of power. That wasn't a relationship between a teacher and a teenager. Uh, that that is an abuse of power. We have to bring examples in the teaching of Jesus into our world that we inhabit in the church. And we have to give examples of this is what abuse of power looks like in the home. And it's not just sexual abuse, of course. It's domineering uh, verbal abuse or emotional patterns of humiliation and control degrading others, shaming others, uh, for example, um, spiritually controlling others um, as well, giving examples of abuse of power in the home, abuse of power in the church. This is what it could look like, helping people understand these are the realities Jesus was speaking to in John 10 and other passages. And we as Christians have to be aware of this and account for this. Um, and that we are calling people to follow Jesus. Jesus, who when Jesus rose from the dead said, all authority or all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. All power belongs to Jesus. Our fundamental confession as Christians, and it has been since the, the beginning of the church, who is Lord? Jesus is Lord. Jesus holds all power and authority. That means any power we hold in our work, in our families, in any relationships, in the church, all of that power belongs to Jesus. The only legitimate use of power for us as Christians is for the purposes of Jesus and in the way of Jesus. Any other use of power is illegitimate, whether it's in the home or the church or anywhere. Uh, to me, that is, um, this is something uh, a mentor of mine, Dr. Diane Langberg, has been so powerful in helping me and others um, at Grace understand, and we're, we're happy to share this with churches. And then Jesus, of course, condemned the disciples who were fixated on their own power and how it would benefit them. And Jesus said, those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. And Jesus essentially said, that's the wrong mentality. That's the mentality uh, that, you know, many have in this world. But you as disciples are to have a very, a radically different mentality. That you are to simply view any power you hold to be used to help and serve and protect and bless others. Um, you are to take the role of a servant. So, as leaders, we have so many resources, especially directly on Jesus's teaching with power, to name abuses of power. And it's, of course, it goes beyond words. It's our mentality. It's our example and how we're demonstrating that these are the commitments of Jesus, um, that we have boundaries related to our community. We have uh, standards because we take the teaching of Jesus seriously. We really do care deeply about this being an environment 
of respect and safety. So again, we're not cultivating paranoia or, or, or saying we can't you know, trust anyone here. That's not the right mentality. We're going to talk more about that in, in a moment after the break. But certainly uh, to call people positively to treating one another with respect, to respecting certain boundaries. Uh, and then as a leader, making sure we are setting a, a wonderful example of transparency and respect for the, the policy boundaries we've set in place for our community with, with children and adults. Hey, Mike, so, in the chat room, yes. someone asked if you could repeat what you said about the only legitimate use of power. Yes. So because our, our confession is Jesus is Lord, and Jesus said after he rose, um, all power or all authority is given to me. That means any authority or power we hold as Christians. And we, we hold power um, in our church roles, in our relationships, in our homes, uh, in our workplaces, uh, if those are outside of the church, wherever we hold power or any sort of authority, as Christians, we know all authority or power belongs to Jesus. So the only legitimate use of our power or any authority we have is in the way of Jesus, for the purposes of Jesus. And Jesus very clearly calls us to protect others, to serve others, <laughs> to seek to bless others. And that's the mentality we're called to. Yeah, thanks for that. All right, before we go to our lunch break, um, now's a good time if you have, now knowing we're going to be talking about caring for survivors in the next segment, and we're going to be talking about response issues um, and recognizing concerning behavior uh, in, in the segments to come in the, the third and fourth segment. Um, but at this point, you know, knowing there's a lot of practicalities, we still have to fill in. Are there any thoughts you wanted to, to just share, anything you're thinking, uh, something you wanted to, to process out loud or, or a question? Uh, now's a good time for that before we break for lunch. One person in the chat room said the word privilege can be used in, the, in, in place of the word power in this setting. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. And being aware of that, um, the power or privileges we hold, um, certainly I'm well aware as a white man, uh, there, my experience and how I am interacted with is vastly different. From the experience of others and as i listen to uh, others who have a different experience i'm constantly trying to be humble and learn and understand that more um, as again as a six eight man i'm not typically afraid walking through a parking lot at night but i know there are women in my life and we've we've had conversation that of course that's not their experience and it's imp so important to to put ourselves in the shoes of others. We can't fully do that, but seek to do that and recognize that it is a responsibility to use any privilege or power to, to serve others and to be aware of how, and not just individually, but systemically uh, there can be harm. So yeah, other, yeah, other like thoughts or I, questions. Yeah. One, one observation, and I understand it. Um, you know, when, you, when we were looking at the illustration of Pastor Mark and we're looking right. for power does he have uh, most of the comments were what i would call soft power you know it's relational power whatever and it took a while to talk about uh uh positional power institutional power yeah uh, and I, everybody on the call is a leader in some way shape or form and many are pastors and yes. i think we forget that in the church i forget yeah. the superintendent right like i'm like well i'm just pam and i forget the way <laughs> right. right that my words have and i just want to say i think I think that's just something important to be aware of is yeah. that as soon as you're the pastor or the leader, um, you have power that you just may not recognize. That's right. And I, I do want to protect our lunch time, but is there any, any question anybody has before we break? Maybe, maybe just one so we can protect that lunch time. I think people are hungry. <laughs> let's 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 eat. Pam, do you want to uh, send us to lunch with anything? 
Uh, yeah, we're back at, is it at 1245? 1245. Right? Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, let me pray. <laughs> Wonderful. Lord, as uh, we head to lunch, some of us individually and some of us in groups at churches, um, I just pray that you would be uh, helping us to process what we're hearing and to listen to your spirit and uh, bless this time of eating as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Have a good break, everyone. See you at 1245.